Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 49 of the All Dolphins podcast today. For my friend John, no, I'm not going to go with William Judson, the cornerback from the 80s, who would have been an easy choice. I'm going to go with one of my favorite fullbacks of all time in Dolphin history, who, fun fact, is now a player agent, Tony Page. Right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I, you finally named the player I know. Oh, See, there you go. You probably know him as an agent, though, right? I do. See, there you go. So today we're going to tackle fan questions. Before that, uh, I rewatched the game this morning uh, and came up with a couple of quick tidbits that I wanted to put out there. Number one, I want to correct myself when I said the first team offensive line was basically flawless when two was in the game. It was not. There was a play with where they called for a tight end screen and Robert Hunt completely whiffed. He whiffed and it forced an incompletion because two didn't have the time for the play to develop. So that's number one. Number two, very interesting when I keep, <laughs> as of when I was nodding yes, uh, as I keep pointing out that this notion of needing a backup fullback if Alec Ingold has to miss some time, I, and I said they can use tight ends as H-backs. Well, I noticed that they had Eric Saubert in that role yesterday. Eric Saubert, who, by the way, had some nice blocks. He also left the game limping at one time, and I think he slammed his helmet on the ground. He was very visibly upset. Um, played very well, and there uh, was mm -mm. no disagree with you. Special teams bad. Um, saw missed some opportunities in the passing game. I would say he's tight end number three, and I'm not sure he's on my 53. But continue. Go ahead. I saw it differently. Okay, I saw him with a couple of good blocks. Uh, and then I had one other observation. Oh, Dan Feeney played a lot of right guard. In the second half, uh, after Robert Jones left, they had rookie free agent Alamo Luave playing center. And this just showcased the versatility that Feeney brings as a backup interior offensive lineman. So those are the three things that stuck out as I rewatched the game. When I rewatched the game, and I rewatched the game at 3 o'clock in the morning, I don't know why. Um... Oh, so basically, since you were probably half asleep, we should take your observations with I'm just kidding. No, I I, I I was up and I, I was up and I couldn't sleep. And I was like, okay, let me get this done now since I, I'm on toddler duty today because my wife is working a, a, a Sunday shift. So uh I gotta get it in when I get it in. Um, I was very impressed with Austin Jackson. I thought Austin Jackson was the top performing offensive lineman on the unit. Um, props goes to him. There's really a transformation and i don't think i'll be backing off this one like noah because noah was really scheme specific whereas austin jackson is just improvement um i'm i as i said yesterday i'm really impressed with the run blocking of this unit and i have to give their new offensive line coach damn name escapes butch me barry butch barry um some props because he comes highly criticized based off his tenure at Denver and tenure at the University of Miami. And I, I trust Mike McDaniel because I know exactly where he comes from and I know what school he comes from. Um, and I know who vouches for him. So I'm not saying that I doubt it. But, you know, when you hear players applaud his firing in Denver, um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Oh. Um and, and he was highly bombed, criticized at University of Miami. Um, that's not a great thing. Now, not everybody's a good fit for college, especially if you have an abusive coaching style, which is allegedly what 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 what's the case. And I'm I'm paying attention to it. He's aggressive. Players aren't complaining. So, props. And it seems to be working. They are coaching to aiming points. They are coaching to spots. And even if you don't, even if you, even if you don't engage with somebody at that spot, if you do damage or get in the way or cut block, it creates angles. And I like what I'm seeing from everybody, with the exception of one gentleman who Poop is going to take this as an offensive statement. I'm not liking what I'm seeing from Robert Hunt in this scheme style so far. It can get better. It's not where I would expect it to be for a guy that I'm thinking is worthy of a $9 million a year contract. 
And right now, I'm at the point where I'm holding off from extending Robert Hunt. Especially at that price. No, I, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't zone in on Robert Hunt maybe as much as you did. Uh, I didn't, other than the whiff, I didn't notice anything egregious. So I will defer. He, to he allowed a sack too. I believe I believe Hunt allowed a sack. And not Tua. Tua wasn't uh, the, the Tua wasn't sacked. The offensive line was there for few plays after Tua left, and there was no sack during that time. The one sack came from the back. Is there one sack well, on the, the game? play with the bad shotgun? The bad shotgun snap where Chris oh, where yeah. Don Ackman got bowled over by Will Anderson. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was a free run. That was basically the play designed. Austin Jackson went inside. It was designed. First of all, it was designed for Skyler to drop back quicker than that, but he couldn't because the snap was high. Then he still went ahead and did the fake handoff to Ahmed before Ahmed got in position. Completely wasn't set and got bowled over. I do want to say this about Connor Williams. I think I said it last night, but just in case, I thought I noticed him a couple of really, really good run blocks. I know what's going to stand out is the two bad shotgun snaps, and those have got to stop. But overall, and the last thing I'll say on the offensive line, uh, and this was interesting. This is my in my snap count observations that I do after every game. If you notice, they took out all of the offensive line after I think it's 14 snaps, except for Isaiah Wynn, who wound up playing like 10 to 12. Yeah, game. And yeah. he, he wasn't great. Um, I, I, I've been saying that for the past couple of weeks. It's, like the door is open and it's she's just not kicking it down. Yeah. Um. I don't know if I have any options now. Lester I mean, is the I, guy to watch without question. Is the guy to watch and hopefully the injury that kept him out of the game. He's not the guy to watch. He might be the last man standing. Lester yeah, that's, is. That's what I'm saying. I'm injured. saying that's the guy. Robert Jones is injured. I think that's where I think we're at where we're at. Like you know, and I'm not letting Liam back in the competition. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So it is, you know, you have uh, right now. You have Liam hate and Noah hate. No, don't do me like that. Don't do me like that. I have it's too strong. Yeah, um, I'm I'm going to revisit Liam in a month. Liam will get an opportunity when somebody goes down. We'll revisit it in a month. That 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 your confidence is gone, and I can't trust you. And with Noah. And I didn't think Noah played very bad. I, I, I feel bad now that I had him as my stock down because when I rewatched the film, it was like an accumulation of things. Yes, he got beat on certain plays, but as usual, it wasn't like he was in bad position. Um, so I felt like I was being overly critical of Liam. If I had to do it all over again, I probably would have put Connor Williams as, as my stock down along with Keon Smith. You mean of um, Noah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you balance out Connor Williams as a stock down? How do you balance out the really good run blocking? So it would have been strictly because of the bad, the two bad snaps. You can't, and, you can't afford two bad snaps. That's that's fair. potentially two bad turnovers. Well, the two plays resulted in like I think it was like a fourteen yard loss on the sack, and then a uh, five yard loss on the running play to Mostert because by the time Tua was able to cradle the ball in and make the handoff, I mean Mostert had three guys on him. Um, Noah was very good in run support. I will say this. I, I did notice him. He was good in run support. And I thought Eli Apple was very good in coverage. Oh, when something else I, that I noticed, if you the, when the Dolphins opened with the four down linemen, including Emmanuel Agbo, they had only two cornerbacks on the field because there was a 4-3-4. Four, four, and the two cornerbacks were Xavier Howard and Cater Kohu. So uh, let's think of the idea that it's going to be Cater Kohu on the outside when they're in four DB and when they go nickel or dime, then Cater goes to the slot and then it's Eli Apple or Noah uh, on the, on the outside. That's my thinking. Um, I think Noah's battling an injury right now um, based on what I've heard or something like Noah's Cater's banged up, not Noah, Cater. Yeah, Cater. Cater okay. So then why, then why did he play? Why did he start? I don't know. Oh, okay. like, no, that, that, that wouldn't that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense, especially since he's a one of the guys in the secondary whose spot is very secure. Why would you play him if he's nicked up? I mean, what explain to me why Xavier is playing in the exhibition season? Because like, he's not nicked up. Because he's not so no, my point is if, if X was nicked up, you think he's in the game? Hell no. no. Okay, then X shouldn't be in the game in, in any way. I but yeah, yeah, well, that's a whole entirely different conversation. But my point is that 
no, I don't believe Cater is nicked up. He may have been for the first game when he was kept out, or he may have been one of those where he's kept out along with everybody else because I, we're not I, playing anybody. I just remember McDaniel saying something about Cater banged up. Yes. Or, yes. You know, and every, you know, hell, Tyreek wasn't supposed to practice some last week and he practiced and he played. You or, know, so, and or, so, or so he said. <laughs> now, now you just don't believe anything Tyreek said. <laughs> I question everything he said, basically. It's like, that's that's a problem that's a trust issue right there <laughs> all right um i t- to to i don't really have any more notes from the game um i would have liked to have seen more from eric uzakama and and Cho- robbie chosen but every unit and, and julian hill um might be something there might might be he did in line work and wasn't bad he blocked fine, um, and, and I noticed Elijah Higgins, who, by the way, played like half the snaps that Hill did, and one time he got trying to block somebody, and he was just trying. He wasn't blocking him. All right. Um, yeah, it, it's, you know, I'm just very curious what this week is going to look like, not just from a practice standpoint, but from a game standpoint, and and then and then we get down to the cuts. So let's get into these questions. Let, let's Gabe has our first one. If Nick Needham starts the season on the PUP, which both me and you have said is an absolute certainty, and Ramsey out, and Cam Smith's shoulders a concern, and Noah seems to be struggling a little bit, adding a slot guy like Bryce Callahan and moving Kohu to the boundary seems ideal, right? I like the idea of adding Callahan, period, because he's a he's a very good slot corner, even though his, his advanced stats weren't great last year, but he's been a good co- slot corner. And it gives you more depth there, and gives you more fle- gives you more flexibility. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure it's a cause and effect, but I'm always for adding a good a good slot cornerback, especially since yeah, Nick Needham is going to start the season on PUP. He, that means he's out for a minimum of four games. We don't know exactly when he's going to be back, right? Hmm. Um, so yeah, um, they need help. I know you liked what you saw from Nick Perry um, during the game. Yeah. Or- whoa, whoa, whoa. We're talking about Perry Nickerson? Yeah, pa- sorry, Perry Nickerson. Oh, uh, he was great. He was great in coverage. And he is actually lining up outside, even though his, his resume is more as a nickel guy. I mean, he had like three pass breakups. He was like blanketing guys. Again, this oh. was at the end of the game against lesser competition. But, I mean, that's what if he you was say so. Him. If you say so, I I wasn't really watching. I I I was watching defensive line play, most of defensive line play. Tried to keep my eye on some of the safety. Still no Trill Williams. He like, played. He played it, but but we might as well. I mean, I didn't notice him, but he played ninety snaps on defense, six on special teams, and if he didn't play, I wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Nineteen snaps on defense. Where were these nineteen snaps? According to the game book, unless there's a major mistake in the game book. Uh, I, no, I'm I'm not doubting it. I'm going to have to look again and watch again because I didn't see it. Maybe he was on the boundary and I couldn't see the number. Yep, I'm with you. I, I, I um, what was I? I, I I'll wait till the coach's film comes out and is available. Um, yeah, I got to look that up again because I didn't see 19 snaps. Um, let's get to our next question, which comes from OJ Hightower. If a chain needs to be put on the PUP, and he doesn't know that PUP, you can't be put on the PUP if you didn't start the seat training camp on the PUP. Does Brooks make the team over Gaskin since Brooks gives you a power element? Not a chance. But okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, when what was, what would happen to a chain if somehow it's an injury that's going to require a month or so? Is he starts on the fifty three, then they put him on IR the next day. Um, and then somebody else has to get caught to make room for a chain on the 53. And hopefully that player doesn't get picked up by somebody else. And then you resign him afterwards. Now, having gotten that out of the way, no, I don't, I know. I don't think it's for me, it's not a slam dunk that Gaskin, you keep Gaskin over Brooks. I, I, I like mm. Brooks and I think I like Brooks maybe a lot more than you do. I like him. You do like him a lot more than I do. You were talking about him before they even put pads on. Um, I like the power. I like the size. Uh, I think it's definitely beneficial 
But is it absolutely needed? No. But I'm sorry. Gaskins has done too much. We'll, we'll see how this plays out. It's it's too early to tell. Maybe Chris Brooks runs for 100 yards in, in against Jacksonville because he's going to get a showcase opportunity. We'll see how it pans out. Uh, what con- what contributions, major or minor, do you see Braxton Berrios and Durham Smite making to Miami's offense this season? That comes from Darren. Do you want to tackle Go that one first or do you want me to go? Go for it. You go first. Well, I, I see both of them having uh, very clear roles and actually fairly significant roles. Uh, well, Durham Smite's going to be on the field. Now, mind you, Durham, Durham Smite led the Dolphins' tight ends in snaps the past few seasons. For those who think that Mike Gesicki's like descent only happened last year, even before that, Durham Smite always played more snaps than Gesicki, so he's yes. always going to have a role because he's a he's a pretty solid blocker and he's a dependable guy catching the pass, catching the ball to ten to fifteen yards on the field. So there's room for a guy like that. Um, and then, Bryce, are you sure you weren't seeing Eric Saubert? You weren't seeing Smite and thinking it was Saubert? No, because... I, clearly, I clearly detected eighty-two with a couple of good blocks. Because I saw Smite like, as well. Smite as well. I saw Smite playing the H playing the H back role. Oh, on the H back thing, I didn't notice Smite, which is and I, but I know I've done it in the past. I clearly saw Saubert one time. Okay. Hey, props to you, um, Saubert. Not for me, but for you. Uh, okay, and then, and then Barry, Barrios is going to get. I as we yeah. discussed on the previous podcast, to me, he's going to get the third most wide receiver snaps behind Hill and Waddle. Yeah, Barris is your number three receiver. Um, I'm not even sure Chosen makes the team. We'll see. Uh, and um, I think Barris is your number three receiver, number three guy in terms of targets. I think Durham is probably number five in terms of targets. I do believe that Alec Ingle will have, if he's healthy, will have an increased workload and more snaps and probably be the number two tight end. Just okay. just my thought process. Um Dundee Dolphins, he gave us a, a tremendous thanks uh, for our ongoing coverage, and we appreciate that, and we appreciate all of your support. Correct. Thank um, you guys for watching. Yeah. Thank Thank you guys for watching, subscribing, clicking the bell, uh, tuning in. He asked, does Mitchell Agude have any chance of making the 53 ahead of Malik Reed? Yes. He does. I, he does. I'm not, I'm not going to do it, but he does. He has a chance. Um, he has a chance. And as I meant, I'm sorry, as I mentioned last night, the two plays he made in run defense in that one series when Houston was backed up were huge for his case. Yeah. Because we hadn't I, seen that before. If I were a selfish coach, I would not play Mitch Lagude in the final exhibition game with the hopes of uh I'm not putting out so much so that some team will draw interest. Uh, I don't, I'm not really worried about it. As I've said in previous podcasts, I used to have this obsession about, oh my God, if you cut this guy, somebody might claim him. Oh, you might lose him. Oh, 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 oh. And then I look at it five years later and there's literally nothing that got cut that went on and, and became anything anywhere else, um, worth noting. So, but, but I have, you know, we, we say so much about this guy's on your practice squad. And I have a very long, extensive list of guys that I want to be on the Dolphins practice squad. I think it's easier for me to put together my 53-man roster by just taking the 16 I want to put on the practice squad, putting them there, and then deciphering my roster from that point. Um, because there are a lot of guys like Peely. Doesn't make well, my 53. But hold on. Before you you revealed your entire list, I would say that sounds like a good story for you to write for alldolphins.com. Fair. That's called the teaser. Here's my thing too. If you're cutting a guy with the idea that we'll put him on the practice squad and it'll become somebody to me that, that basically you're saying he's not good enough. If the guy's good enough that he's somebody that you want to have, then you keep him on the roster. I, I, I'm not buying this notion of, Oh, he'll be on the practice squad and he'll become a stud off the practice squad. If he's good enough, he's on your 53. Yeah. But we've done that the other way with, with the Trill Williams is of the world. And, and the, um, I forget the fullback from, I mean, the running back from Stanford, we we've done that for years and rarely had do guys come out and turn out to be Nick Needham and Nick Needham was a practice squad call up. So, you know, it, it, it can go the other way too, where practice squad called ups can, can be, be prominent 
Jesse Davis is a practice squad call up. Don't say anything disrespectful because you know I'm sensitive about Jesse Davis. Same here. Um, same here. I love the dude. Uh, and you know, I didn't say they're going to be stars, but Jesse Davis is a multi year starter for a team. Now he sucked when you asked him to play left tackle, which was something that he had no business playing. Correct. Um. Anyway, uh, I. Mitchell Gude, I want to continue to invest in him. I don't know what he can be, but I'm not putting him on my 53. Okay. Unless you can bust heads on my on 53, like Garrett Nelson did. Garrett Nelson was busting heads. You might have a spot on my 53, because mm -hmm. I might need you from special teams. You need a Walt Aikens on your 53. And I just don't see that player on this roster right now. Maybe... maybe Maybe some like like Malik Reed will become that player, or maybe we can count on Duke to do that role, Duke Riley. But it it's just not there right now. But I'm I'm also not at the point where I'm keeping a guy on my 53 just to have him on my special teams. But if it was that, it would be Garrett Nelson. Um, let let's get to uh, Jay Cutler asked. <laughs> no, he's not. Yeah, we love we love Jay Cutler. <laughs> Big bad Smokey something. I don't know. Okay. Why can't Connor Williams fix the snapping issue in year two at center? These types of mistakes can't continue to happen, especially when you're asking for a new contract. How concerned are you? Well, uh, yeah, the, the the part where you're at, you're equating it with or relating it to him asking a new contract, sure. Uh, but here's the thing, though. The thing that's semi discouraging is it comes and goes. I mean, remember early last training camp, it was like, oh, what a disaster. And then he it settled down, and I don't recall having many issues. If I don't in the regular season, I don't either. And then this summer started off really, really well. And I think fairly recently now, all of a sudden they're showing up again. Um, how concerned am I? Yeah. I mean, it basically it killed two plays last night or yesterday afternoon, I should say. And if it happens in the regular season, it's going to kill a play. And maybe at some point it's going to cause a turnover on top of it. Um, other than having the guy like do 500 shotgun snaps after practice every day. I don't know exactly what the, what the solution is though i i'm with you i don't know what the solution is uh he was a concern for me in the in the exhibition season last year then he got to the regular season it wasn't an issue let i'm just hoping it's a money year i know guys usually perform well on a money year so i'm not i'm not too concerned um eric asked is the o-line improved this year i see a better austin jackson i see good play from lamb and some of the backups not saying the line is polished, elite, or dominant, but I see good blocking, able to handle the stunts, and just just as important depth. Or is it just hope and wishful thinking? That's a good question, Eric. And it's a question that I'm closely, closely, closely monitoring. And I've been monitoring. Yeah, everybody knows I'm obsessed with offensive line play. I watch it every single day. No, really? really? Yeah. I, um, it was sexy yesterday against Houston. But as you pointed out, which I did not know, Houston was one of the worst teams against the run last year. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to get overly excited about it. But I'm seeing a different Austin Jackson. Never seen this guy in his career. Never seen him. Um, I'm not really happy where where I am with Robert, where, where the team is with Robert Hunt. That's a little bit surprising to me. Connor Williams, I don't worry about because primarily Connor Williams – doesn't have a heavy load in pass protection and in run game. He's, he's close to elite. He's not elite. He's close to elite. He's, good. he's very good. Uh, left guard mystery meat. I have no clue. I wish Isaiah Wynn was playing better. It wasn't bad yesterday, but it wasn't where I expected it to be. And I'm a Kendall Lamb fan. I just am. I, I, if you told me that you had to start the first month of the season with without Toronto Armstead and Kendall Lamb is going to be starting, I'd be like, okay, uh, let me let me see how it works. And I'm not even panicking. I'm not even moving Isaiah Wynn to left tackle because I might make the argument, and I'm sure somebody can counter it, but I, I, I would make them say, make sure you watch offensive line play every day. Kendall Lamb might be the – Oh, and Omar is having internet issues again. I think Omar was about to say that Kendall Lamb might be the, what, the fourth best offensive lineman on this team. 
don't know if I'd go that far, maybe, yeah. but he's very, very but, solid. And eventually Omar's gonna jump back after happened? his internet stops freezing on him. We gotta we gotta do make do some kind of like here we go. He's back. We gotta do I was about to say we have to do some kind of collection of GoFundMe for Omar to get better internet because this happened <laughs> a little bit too much. So you froze when you were saying that you might even put Kendall Lamb as your what the fourth best offensive lineman on the team? Yeah, I definitely okay. think he's ahead of a left guard. Um, all the left guard contenders, and I'm I might put him ahead of Robert Hunt. Like right. you are, is 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 Robert Hunt headed into Noah Liam territory for you? Man. No, he's not. No, okay, I just expect I just expect more. I That's just expect good. you should be a top two performer on that line. Okay, here's and I'm my not seeing it. Okay, here's my bottom line on the offensive line and why to me it's a slam dunk right now that every Dolphin fan should feel better about it than at this time last year. Because right now I'd say Kendall Lamb is a better backup left tackle than what they had last year at this time. Left guard is is a mystery just like it was last year. Connor Williams is there. Robert Hunt, if even if he's not performing the same way he did last year, is it that much of a drop-off? I'd say no. And Austin Jackson right now, I would agree with you, looks significantly better than he ever has. So you got a major upgrade at backup left tackle and a major upgrade at right tackle. So yes, I absolutely feel there is reason for optimism for this offensive line, understanding that it's not the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line. No. And maybe not the, the 49ers offensive line. Those lines, there are very, very, they are very, very few and far between. It, it, I think based on what I've seen from two games and I, I really need the Jacksonville game. I think they can be a top 10 run, run blocking line. I, they reminded me a lot of those Denver lines back in the, in the Shanahan era where mm -hmm. it's not a bunch of names, but it's a bunch of athletic dudes who are going out there and they play with an aggressive style that make defenders play on their heels because they don't want to be cut. And they're terrified of those teams and if you play with that mentality and that nastiness and that attitude and that aggressiveness, all oh, backs will have openings because defenders play watching their knees, um, play, play with very tentative style. So, and I, 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 I love it. I absolutely love it. And I love what I've seen from the first two games. Um, and, 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 and this is not positive Omar speaking, because that's what that starts Monday. It starts this tomorrow. Is, okay. this, this is just, Straight shooter Omar, I I have seen enough to think that this isn't fool's gold, it, and it's it's a lot of Butch Barry and a lot of the coaching. It reminds me a lot of what we saw in the early signs of the unicorns, where they're mowing people down and creating alleys. And if you could have that run game you had in 2016, oh, this team is going to be good if Tua can be Tua. Okay. Um, let's go to Elliot Guzman, who asks if the Dolphins' run game is as important as it seems. Do you think we have a top ten running game, and will it help to be a top five QB? You answer that. Uh, top, to top five, five QB. Uh, I, we're not there yet. I'll reserve judgment. <laughs> I'm not making. I'm not making predictions. Uh, you know how I feel. Um, Tua will be efficient. Will deliver what's there. Uh, he's got certain physical limitations. I'll 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 duck and or actually I'm not gonna duck. I, I'm tired no, of that, that. You didn't say anything that wasn't a fact. No, except 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 there are, there's a certain segment of the Dolphin fan base who get all up in their feelings when I say that. Sorry, that's a fact. Okay, and if you can't see that, your congratulations. You're a great fan. But you're not objective and you're not realistic and accept that. Um, Drew Brees had limitations as a passer. Peyton Manning had limitations as a passer. I, I understand. Well, no, I said physical limitations as a passer. Peyton Manning was also 6'6". Six, six. Drew Brees' comparison is a little bit better. But I think by all accounts, and this is not just me saying this, Drew Brees was at the different classes of, of as an athlete than Tua. Okay. Having said all that, look well, it up. Different classes of look athletes. it up. Look it up. I mean, Drew Brees was like a champion tennis player or something to that effect, like that. Um, hey, man, Tua's a champion. Having said, player, but having said all that, respect on Tua. 
having said all that, what's the definition of a top five? We're talking statistically. We're talking like in terms of pure ability. In terms of pure ability, sorry, I don't know if he's I mean, ever... he was a top five QB last year. He was a, he was a number one rated passer in the NFL. Okay, but that's part of it is the product of the entire offense, which he directed beautifully. And if everything around him works great, towards your is a perfect quarterback for this offense, and he's going to make it hum. Okay, as okay. far as whether, whether the, the offense can be top 10 in what category, in terms of yards, in terms of rushing average, in terms of yards, it's going to require dedication from Mike McDaniel to stick with it. And it's going to be awfully tempting to always fall back on Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle at crunch time because, again, those two guys are the ones who the most easily can make things happen because of their speed. Get my lick back, ass. I was rooting for Chosen O. Oh. But I don't know anymore. After this preseason game, is he in your top six wide receivers? Oh, that's all yours. You know that's all yours, Omar. Listen, listen. I it was one pass. It was a little bit high, a little bit behind him. He should have t- hands touched it. You should have brought it in. Um, I'm riding with chosen. There was one play I can't remember the play. It was a Skyler Skyler, and chosen was chosen was wide open behind the receiver in the end zone. Skyler didn't find him, didn't see him. It is what it is. Skyler scored on that drive. Chosen gets open. If you're watching the coach's film, he does. He does. you can't deny that Chosen doesn't get open. Now, whether you throw it to him, that's a whole su- different subject. Give me a wide receiver that gets open. Chosen's on my 53. I've drawn a line in the sand. Um, I'm I like sorry. it. I like the decisiveness. River Craycraft, love you, but I can put you on my practice squad. You know you'll eventually get elevated. Give give me some time, but I'm sorry. Chosen's my number four. I can't, I can't, I can't ignore what I see. I can't. Okay. And now, for me, for me, in the interest of fairness, because I because I know I would get killed if I said the same if if it was another quarterback who had thrown that pass. That's a bad pass. Okay. Yes, yes, chosen could have caught it. That's a bad throw. Okay. And it was an easy slant where again. Chosen that separation, clear lane. It was it wasn't like he had to throw it over anybody, and he zipped it really, really high and hard. Uh, Skyler had a really, really good game last night. Uh, yesterday, that was not a good throw. Let's run through some of these questions because we got a couple minutes left. What's right. the likelihood that neither Liam or Austin start on the line? Very, li- very, very high likely likelihood that Liam doesn't start. Yes. Austin is definitely starter. I would say he's the number one offensive lineman right now. Uh, he, show me another one who's performing like Austin. You can use a felt tip pen, magic marker, anything for Austin Jackson. Yes, he's starting. Uh, what's wrong with special teams from Tony D? Uh, Sanders yeah, is the mid- answer is yes. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Any solutions? Waiver wire. <laughs> Claim, listen, if a Neville Hewitt's on, on the street getting cut by Houston – Sign me up because Neville Hewitt is a special teams demon. So, you know, those are the guys that I'm looking for to add to my team when, when people start to trim their 53 man roster killer Smurfs. Do you see the coaches treating the third game like a dress rehearsal or prep like it, but still sit most of the starters? Well, I'm going to defer to what they did last year. Cause again, they follow the same pattern from game one to game two. So logic says it's going to be the same pattern for game three, which was everybody plays, but they play only two series. This idea of the quote unquote dress rehearsal as a third game, that kind of changed a little bit. And when they reduced the preseason from four to three games, where it was always game number three. Now, some coaches do a dress rehearsal. Some coaches even, I don't even know if they do. There no, there's no game planning or anything like that. Um, so my expectation is, yes, everybody plays, but only a series or two or two series. Diddy Wilkinson says, is Christian Wilkins worth 18 to $20 million a year? And if so, what is Zach Sealer worth? Mm. That's all you. Damn, why you got to do me like that? Um, 18, not 20 on Christian. And I'm being generous. Okay. Ge- generous. Um, no disrespect to Christian. Christian could probably have a double-digit sack season this year and wave bye-bye to you. Um, and I would respect that. He's improved every single season. What's Zach Sealer worth? I'm going to go with $8 million a year. 
I, I, I'm, 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 I'm putting a 20 million guarantee on the table. And I, I believe Zach Sealer is smart enough to not walk away from $20 million in his pocket. Okay. And I will just counter one thing you said uh, that if Christian gets like 12 sacks or whatever, he's bye-bye. If he gets 12 sacks, the Dolphins put the franchise tag on him and then negotiate the kind of deal where, where he gets the big money. Okay. If you make me go through all that and I deliver 12 sacks, I don't want to be with you anymore. Um, Tony G asks, what does Scott, why does Skyler always perform better in the preseason games? Uh, looks like he's the, hey, he's got the backup job. No. Why? Because it's the preseason. <laughs> the no, number one, he's not going against frontline players. Number two, defenses don't generally show a whole lot. As we discussed last night, when you made the point that Vic Fangio is not showing anything right now. Well, guess what? The Miko Ryans or the Houston DC, I don't, I don't know who it is. I apologize. They didn't show me. DC here, the guy with the beard. I can't remember his name now. Um, under Gase. The one him? that used to oh. go used to hunt tigers and stuff like Matt that. Matt Burke. Okay. They're Matt, Matt Burke. Oh, we love Matt Burke. How could I forget? Matt, sorry. Uh, well, guess what? Matt Burke didn't show anything yesterday either. So it's a different that this is why, and Omar and I are, are guilty of this. Everybody's guilty of this overreacting to preseason games. Understand the concept both offensively and defensively are very, very, very basic. And no, Skylar White does not have the number two job uh, locked up. Chip Skylar asks a very good question. Who are the teams you think that we cannot beat? Looking around the league, it looks like we can beat any team. You don't seem to think so. I'm assuming he's referring to me. Um, let me let me begin this answer. Uh, I believe that there are about four elite NFL teams in the NFL. Now, can any team in the NFL be an elite team? Yes. Of course. It's, it depends on the injuries, depends on the matchups, it depends on whether your quarterback's turning the ball over. Um, it depends on do you have a hot hand at the moment. Um, can Miami beat Kansas City? Yes. Can, well, would Miami, if they played like an NBA team uh, and it's a seven-game series, my uh the the it would probably be the series would be probably be done four one, so um they're in a different league. Uh, I also believe that the Jets will be a contender, tremendous challenge to Miami. You, I'm I haven't seen what Dalvin Cook brings to the table, but you can't add an elite run game to a, an elite defense with a Hall of Fame quarterback and not think it's gonna make a difference. Now their offensive line probably a little boo boo, but. That's what real good running backs do. They improve offensive lines. You yeah. Who can they not beat? Well, no, I, I, the phrasing of the question is wrong because on any given day, I remember a couple of years ago, Indy, which was bad at the time, beat Casey. So this idea of, yeah, any team can beat any other team on a given day. I like what you said, though. Make it a best of seven series. Logically, Casey beats the Dolphins in the best of seven series. I think Cincinnati beats the Dolphins in the best of seven series. I think – the Jets could be could be tough. Buffalo could be tough. Um, and then this is this is where what I said on another show got killed for it. There are like six or seven other teams behind the the powers in the AFC who are really good teams who all could or could not make the playoffs. Name them: Jacksonville, the Chargers, Baltimore, Pittsburgh. Uh, in addition to the aforementioned. Cleveland. Yeah, I think Cleveland's going to be good. Everybody's talking about Cleveland. I don't know why, but because they're stacked. And the reason they sucked last year is because Deshaun Watson was not Deshaun Watson because he hadn't played in a year and a half, and he was brutal when he came back. Now with with a uh, that time span having gone by, if he goes back to being Houston, Deshaun Watson, look out for Cleveland. That division is completely brutal. Jacksonville, which plays in a bad division, is going to smoke that division, and they're going to be really good. Um, Denver figures to be better, exactly how much better, we don't know. And then you got the three beasts in the AFCs with the Jets and Buffalo and the Dolphins. So, yeah, the Dolphins are a really good team. They're a playoff caliber team. Doesn't mean they're a slam dunk to make the playoffs. And we'll end on that cheerful note. And remember I said they're a very good team. Cheerful note because we're about to run out of time. Uh, this was episode 49. Tony Page, subscribe. You know what to do. We don't need to repeat it anymore. Uh, we'll be back at it tomorrow, Omar. Until then, 